Hallelujah. Got double mics here. Hallelujah. What a wonderful service we've had so far, and we reconnect with our X series. Last week we had an injunction. We had a, a, a powerful preaching from Joyce Chu. She challenged us. She was really powerful. How many would want to hear from her again? Mm. We'll find space on the roster. Because she really challenged us. If I, if I would ask, who remembers something that challenged them? Can somebody tell just one thing? Yeah? Mm, are you saving God for nothing? And what was key for me was let your lifestyle match your theology. That was powerful. That was powerful. So maybe we'll just stand for one minute, just one minute to acknowledge the presence of the Lord. The Lord says, be still and know that I am God. And we've just been encouraged by our brother Swadesh there. You know, when people are sitting around, standing around and coming to church, sometimes you don't know how much they hold, how much they have, what experiences they've had. They've just been assured we have a father who loves us unconditionally. And it's this father who says, be still and know that I am God. I'm the Lord that heals you. So we dedicate this standing for one minute in silence just to acknowledge our Father who is in heaven. We can be silent for about a minute. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for salvation. For your son died on the cross for us, demonstrating your love for us, O oh God, that you gave us your only begotten son because you loved us so that we shall not perish if we believe in him. And we are privileged to be those who believe in him. Thank you for eternal life in him. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. We may take our seats. Now, today I'll be continuing from where Pastor Dale left. Um, he covered Acts chapter 1 from verses 1 to 8. And I'm starting from verse 9. I'm one person who needs this clicker, but I don't like it. Now, the team there, we are preaching together. When I flick a page, you know it's next slide. Easy. Now, the title of my message, if you can see it, is that it's community, prayer, and the Holy Spirit. It's important to understand it right from the beginning... Because if you read it wrong, you get the wrong message. The correct reading is community, prayer, and the Holy Spirit. If you read it as community prayer, you remove the comma, it's a different meaning. It's a different message. 
but it's community, prayer, and the Holy Spirit. That's the journey I want us to be on. One might be wondering, why is it important to study the book of Acts? Why? Why at all? Acts gives us the record of the spread of Christianity from the coming of the Holy Spirit until the word got to the then world's capital, which was Rome. Acts records that. It is therefore the record of the continuation of those things Jesus Christ had started. He continued them as the head of the church and the one who then sent the Holy Spirit. So the 30 years covered by the book are so important in that it marks a period of transition because the, the gospel was preached first and foremost to the Jews. It was Jews only. But we saw it transition to all the parts until we got to Rome. All the Greek islands and the, the, the towns and all other uh, places until we got to Rome. And why is this important? It's because sometimes we start in our home group, we start as people of one culture, we start as maybe Zimbabweans, then we have Nigerians and Sierra Leones and Ghanaians and, and Kenyans coming, it means we are moving into a transitional period where we stop doing things the Zimbabwe way. What I'm saying is that whatever your home group is, whatever your ministry is, when you begin to do things as that homogeneous quantity of people, and you are doing things the style of your own culture, without transitioning, very soon you begin to regress. So when we are in a process of transition, we change our lifestyle, we change our language, we change our songs, we change even our jokes and our teasings of other people. We don't mock other nationalities anymore because we are in a process of transition. I want you to be invited to this journey because if we don't take care of that, we miss the experience of the early church. If we want that experience, let's be invited to how it moved from one town to another. The book of Acts also has the doctrines that are later developed in the epistles. They appear in the book of Acts in seed form as, you know, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit the kingdom of God, the elders of the church, gentle salvation. However, Acts emphasizes the practice of these doctrines, not just the knowledge. So I'm inviting us to the journey of the practice of the doctrines, not the head knowledge. In case you miss the point of this whole series. This series is not an academic adventure. It is an invitation to a participation with the Holy Spirit to experience what the early church experienced. So that's what you are being invited to. Lest we missed it at the very beginning. Therefore, whatever we are learning now, we need to put into practice. Remember our theme, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. There are three strategies, development, deployment and discovery. We then redevelop, redeploy and rediscover. It's a movement, not a stagnant kind of thing. So church is a movement. We are not a water receptacle. It's flowing living water we're talking about. So that's what I'm inviting us to. It's important I explain this before I go to my section. Even if I don't end up preaching that section, this is very important. I'll then continue next week. James 1.27 reads, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, 
So religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to, to keep oneself unstained from the world. This is what the book of Acts is inviting us to. Not just the knowledge, but the experience of the early church. Galatians 6.10 so then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. We are talking about looking after each other, doing good to the household of faith. Do you know a Christian who doesn't come to this church, but they are in your neighborhood? Are you doing good to the household of, of faith? You see another Christian going through a tough time, Oh, you know, oh, they are suffering because they are just the Anglicans, you know, because I'm Pentecostal. <laughs> we are talking about valuing a person called Christian because Jesus died for them. Otherwise, how can we value those others Jesus died for who are not yet saved? We need to be a witness to them, but they will see it when we love one another. Shall so all people know that you are my disciples when you have love one for another. So the book of Acts is not about the knowledge of the history of it. It is about the practice of it. And you are being invited to that practice. It doesn't matter who will be preaching or teaching on what section it is. This is what we are inviting us to. Now when you look at the final judgment in Matthew 25 to 31... When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the gods. And he will place the sheep in his right, but the gods on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and fed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when, when did we see you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and clothed you? And when, when did we see yeah, you sick or in prison and visited you and the king will answer them uh, truly I say to you uh, as you did it to one of the least of these uh, my brothers you did it to me then he will say to those on his left depart from me you cast into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels for I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you as you did, uh, you did not do it to one of the least of these. You did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. We shall not be rewarded for our knowledge of the book of Acts. We will be rewarded for our practice. So I want us to bear that in mind. Whatever section of the book of Acts we are reading. Acts finishes principles of missionary work. The Holy Spirit is the director of missions. Acts also reveals patterns for church life. It reveals the challenges of church planting, how to handle opposition both from within and from outside, how to handle government restrictions and bold response to persecution. I'm not prophesying, but persecution is coming. This is not a prophecy, all right? But it's real. There will be tighter and tighter and tighter laws as we draw closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It will be changing. In your workplace, there are some things you can't do anymore. You can't witness publicly anymore in your workplace. You know that. 
except uh, this bold and short woman in, in, uh, um, in David Jones in Paramara there. She will ask anybody, are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? That one is a saleswoman who sells clothes very well. But she talks about Jesus. She doesn't care. She's very old. You can visit her in David Jones there. Archaeological discoveries confirm in a remarkable way the historical accuracy of Luke's writing. And because X record that true historical events, uh, the, those true event, um, historical events in the book of, um, uh, of X, by the Holy Spirit as he led, the church today under the leading of the same Holy Spirit can experience what the early church experienced. It's not gone with the times. It did not cease. We can experience it today. If we believe that God can still do it. But we have to accept it with humility, faith, and boldness. We have to, if we need to experience it. Now, as we are doing so, we also will be challenged. As we go through the book of Acts, we will be challenged. How it radically challenges today's church. We are in a society where individualism reigns and where the church also seems to have adopted a style of community life that guards the privacy of the individual. But the early church presents a radical community where the members held all things in common. They were a community. Remember community? Then prayer? Then the Holy Spirit? They were a community. Where instead of us singing, I, 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 we begin to change. After singing the I, we sing the we part of it. In every song. It doesn't matter who wrote it. We can replace the I. I is for an island. We can put the we there. Because that's the truth. Jesus did not die for just one person, but for all of us. And you are as worthy of the blood of Jesus shed on Calvary as I am worthy of that blood shed on Calvary. No one is superior to another. Same price. We were purchased the precious price of the blood of Jesus, each one of us. And God calls us his children. So to a society where selfishness is sometimes admired and each one is, is left to fend for themselves, it presents a group of Christians who were so committed to the cause of the gospel that they were willing to sacrifice their desires for the good of others. We are now in a selfish society. I could visit someone, they are sick, and they tell me, it's private, please, it's confidential, don't tell anyone. But do you know they are the same people who complain, nobody from the church visited me, that's why I no longer come to church. No, it doesn't happen in this church. It happens in many churches. Individualistic style, but that's not Christianity. Christianity is a community, not an individual. And the book of Acts challenges that. I want us to be able to see that as we are going through every passage of it, regardless of who is preaching, regardless of who is teaching. I want you to see this. Because to me, it's so exciting as I see it. And I'm challenged. To a society where pluralism defines truth as something subjective and personal, X presents a church that based the, uh, its life on certain facts about God and Christ. Facts that were not only personally uh, true, but also universally valid, and therefore had to be presented to the whole world. The mandate is still the same. Christ is real and valid and the only truth, and it's universal. It's not about pluralism and dialogue. To a society that denies absolute truth and therefore shuns apologetics and persuasion in evangelism in favor of dialogue, 
Acts presents a church that persuaded people until they were convinced of the truth of the gospel. Instead of aiming at mutual enrichment as the main aim of interreligious encounter, as many do today, the early church proclaimed Christ as supreme Lord with conversion in view. There is no other name given under heaven by which we are saved other than the name of Jesus. And every knee must bow, every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God. Jesus Christ is God and it's not negotiable. It cannot change by denial. It cannot change by political correctness. That cannot change its effect and it's valid and it's international, it's universal. Jesus is the only savior of humanity. So in an age where specialization has hit evangelism so much that we rarely find churches that emphasize healing, also emphasizing apologetics, X presents a church where the same individuals performed the healings and preached the highly reasoned apologetic messages. You see, we are not here just about emotion. We are here as faith-seeking understanding and the defense of the gospel. That's why Peter says, be alert and be ready to give a reason for your hope in Christ. That's apologetics, defense of the gospel. It's true, it's real, it's still valid today. That's what you see in the book of Acts. You see quite some convincing reasoning that is there. When Stephen is stoned, for example, we'll get to that in chapter 7, he read the he preached, you know, they didn't have notes like we do here. You know, he narrated the whole history of it. Even Peter, when he did his sermon on the day of Pentecost, the whole history of it, it was very convincing. That's why thousands would be saved. Thousands were added to the church. So in an age when many churches spend so much time, money and energy on self-preservation and improvement, X presents churches that release their most capable people for reaching the lost. You see they're busy in prayer in Acts 18, 1 to 4 there, and the church at Antioch, the Holy Spirit speaks, and they send the most capable people, Paul and Barnabas, go. In an age where many churches look to excellence and in techniques to bring success, X presents a church that depended on the Holy Spirit and gave top priority to prayer and moral purity. X is presenting to us a church that had high priority on prayer and on purity. That's why we hear of all these miracles. And if we want the same experience, Bible methods, Bible results, we neglect prayer, we neglect moral purity, then we get what we always got. Because without holiness, no one will see God. According to Hebrews 12, 14 and 15, without holiness, no one will see God. Not anyone will see God. So in an age where many avenues are available to avoid suffering and therefore many Christians have left out suffering from their understanding of the Christian life, X presents a church that took on suffering for the cause of Christ and considered it a basic ingredient of discipleship. Suffering still remains a basic ingredient of discipleship today. Try and avoid it. You are avoiding the experience. So if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. 2 Timothy 2.12 there. Because people like Paul understood these things. If I suffer with Jesus Christ, then I will reign with him. But we want to do away with the suffering, you see. We associate the suffering with a curse, you see.
Now back to the section I'm dealing with. Acts chapter 1 verses 9 to 11. Though we are going to verse 26, but I'm reading it in portions. The ascension. And when he had said these things, what things are those? What had he just said? Verse 7 of the book of Acts. Then he said to them, it is not for you. You see, when is Jesus Christ coming? Is it the post meal, the A meal, the uh, pre meal? What is it? Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or days the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he, he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Father, thank you for the reading of your word this morning. Bless it, Almighty God, and speak to your people from this passage after the moments of exhortation. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, on the ascension, Jesus' ascension took place after he had given the great commission for the last time. So, in verse 9, you see, yes. He has given, because he's saying after these things in verse 9, after he had said this, then he, he was taken up. So unlike Moses, Elijah, or the philosophers and rabbis of the day, you see, those rabbis and philosophers would leave the work in the hands of their disciples. But Jesus Christ did not leave his work only to the twelve, but to all of us. So you and I have the great commission as your responsibility, as our responsibility, as my responsibility. Jesus Christ left. He passed his work to all believers as his successors to carry out his work of world evangelization and evangelism. There's a difference between evangelization and evangelism. Evangelization is when we are just making people aware about Christ. We invite people to church. We invite them to a barbecue. And we, we, we are saying we are Christians. Come, join us for a barbecue. We go on a fishing trip. That's evangelization. We are creating rapport, friendship, and so on. We are giving them, a, you know, a foot in the door, just an awareness. Evangelism is when we share the gospel, where we're targeting now repentance. They need to know Jesus died for them on the cross. He rose again. He, has, he appeared to many and he, he ascended. You see, we, we, we need people to then know they are sinners and they are supposed to die. But thanks be to God that Jesus died for us on the cross. He who knew no sin was made sin so that we enjoy the salvation of God through him. That's evangelism when we then share the gospel. So most of us are involved, involved in evangelization. We invite people to a music concert. Perchance the word will touch them. It's not bad. But I'm saying, the goal is the evangelism part. They need to repent. They need to know they are sinners. And they need to know the love of God. And that Jesus died for them on the cross. So he prayed for all the... You see, in the Lord's Prayer in... Um, John 17, first he prayed for himself, then he prayed for his disciples, then he prayed for all those who would receive him through the preaching of the disciples. So we are all sent out. In John 13, 34 to 35, that's where, you know, by our love one for another, shall all people know that we are his disciples. So we are a witness when we are loving one another. So we are a witness. We are supposed to continue evangelizing. We are supposed to continue witnessing for him. Now, the early church associated Christ's ascension with his exaltation to God's right hand. 
So the ascension was actually very important in the early church. Because you see, Jesus was crucified. He was buried. We are going to Easter now. Those are the messages we'll be hearing. But he rose on the third day. He then appeared for 40 days to uh, individuals and to 500 at once. Then lastly, he tells them, you know what? Not many days from now, you are going to receive the promise of the Father, the gift of the Holy Spirit. But tarry ye, stay in Jerusalem until you have received that power. Then he ascended. So to the early church, the message of the gospel included the crucifixion, the death and burial, the resurrection and the ascension. That resurrection and ascension in fulfillment of scripture actually marked what was his exaltation. That's why when Stephen was being stoned, what did he see? The heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of the Father. So the ascension is very important. So the expression of he was taken up and, uh, and the people gazing into the sky carries the Jewish idea of heaven as up and earth as below. The world has weird thoughts about heaven and earth. Some people think heaven is just surrounding here. You know, so much something called theology which is not biblical theology. Do you know there's the Islamic theology, there is the Hindu theology, there is Buddhist theology, there is theology is philosophy, right? It's not necessarily Christianity. There's biblical theology. That's what we need. Faith seeking understanding. So when Jesus fed the 5,000, what did he do? He looked up to heaven and he prayed, right? When he raised up Lazarus, what did he do? He looked up and he prayed. So heaven is up, not, not on earth. It doesn't matter what you are being taught out there. So many theologians. But what does the Bible say? What does Jesus say about heaven? What does he say? We need to think about that. Concerning the ascension, many Greek stories of various heroes that ascended up into, so-called, ascended up into heaven by dying. And when they die, people begin to theologize, uh, theologize that, you know, uh, they became gods. Some die and become animals. Incarnation. Reincarnation. So many stories. But for us, Jesus' ascension is a confirmation of his status as the resurrection, uh, at the resurrection, a coronation of the king who was both human and divine all along. So it was a coronation. He had finished the work. He went up to sit on the right hand of the Father. But he makes intercession because that's why when we see Stephen is being stoned, the heavens are opened and he is standing. He's making intercession. For us. The angels that inter um, interrupted these disciples gazing upwards seem to impliedly and mildly rebuke the disciples for just standing and looking into the sky. In verse 11, they're just standing there and looking into the sky, and, and the angels are saying, Men of Galilee, why are you keep on looking up there? This Jesus we have seen gone up. He's coming back exactly the same way you have seen him go up into heaven. In other words, they're saying, you've got some work to do. Don't keep gazing and wondering about what's going to happen next. You've been told what to do. Go assemble in Jerusalem. Wait until the Holy Spirit has come. Then be my witnesses. But you're standing here just gazing. Standing here waiting to see, oh, see what is happening in the Middle East. Jesus is coming back now. Oh, when is he coming? But when he comes, shall he find faith on the earth? Shall he see us doing what we were called to do? Or he will see us 
just gazing, just wondering. We see one miracle, we want more miracles. We want the move of God. But weren't we given some work to do? But we entertain ourselves with the wonders. Yeah? We need to go and assemble to be endued with power to commence work. Obedience is better than wonder. Gather and wait for the Holy Spirit empowerment. Then go to witness for me, is what Jesus had said to them. So this mild rebuke actually reminds us of the angelic rebuke of the, the women. You know, when he resurrected, the women were uh, wandering in the garden there. And the angels come and say, hey, why are you looking for the living among the dead? You see, by the time the angels ask this question, people would have just been hopeless there for a long time. As if there's nothing to do. Keep gazing as if there's nothing to do. Keep wondering what the next move is as if there's nothing to do. The angels specifically give Jesus post-ascension aboard as heaven. That's why Steve, Stephen seized. He was not taught. The heavens, he's being stoned, but the heavens are opened and he's seeing the Son of Man on the right hand of the Father, standing there. And Jesus also says in Matthew 5, 34 to 35, but I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God. So God is in heaven, where Jesus would look up and pray, Father, you always hear me. And that's where Jesus is. When he ascended, he went to be with the Father. Then he released the Holy Spirit. Take no oath, either by heaven for it is the throne of God, all by the earth, for it is his footstool, all by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. You can fight over it as to who must own it and things like that. Hey, it was built by David 3,000 years ago. I know that's a touchy story, it's a touchy issue, very sensitive. Jesus' ascension was so important to the early church's preaching as his resurrection and ascension represented one continuous movement and together constitute his exaltation. This is of great importance to our evangelistic message because no other leader died and rose again. And our, our movement and our belief is based on a fulfilled promise that I will lay down my life and I'll get it back again. I will die and I will rise again. And it happened. That's the basis of our, our belief. Without resurrection from the dead, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that we are actually still in our sins because we would not be saved. We would still be in our sins if Jesus did not rise. We would not have any church. This would be pointless. But we are here because he rose again. So we must include it in our message when we preach. In our evangelism, not just evangelization. The angels also pronounce that Jesus will come back in the same exalted way. Just as he ascended personal, visible, and same Mount Olives. Geographically, you know where it is, yeah? Those who have been there, you know where Mount Olives is, yeah? As such, we as Christians ought to live lives of self-control, holy, upright, godly, as we wait for the glorious day of his return. This is what Titus 2, 11 to 14 says. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. And some people say, oh no, Jesus is only the son of God, he's only a prophet, he's only a teacher. The Bible doesn't say he is God. Here it is here. 
We are waiting in verse 13 of, uh, second, of, of t- Titus 2. We are waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God and Savior. doesn't matter what people are telling you out there. We are equipping the saints for the work of the ministry because we want to be able to stand on the day of temptation and trial and criticism. Jesus Christ is coming back. Zechariah 14, 4 to 5. On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley. So that one half of the mountain shall move northward and the other half southward. Um, And you shall flee to the valley of my mountains for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azal. And you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah king of uh, of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. Is this too much? You're a bit too quiet. Revelation 1.7 Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. You can now read the other section of King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's coming, riding on a white horse. Revelation 19, 11, 16. Next section. X1, 12 to 14. Waiting prayerfully. Remember, it's community. It's prayer. as we fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount uh, called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simeon, uh, and Simon the Zealot and Judas, the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. They were waiting prayerfully. So the 11 remaining disciples walked back from Mount Olives to the upper room, just a a Sabbath day's journey, approximately a kilometer. And they were in this hiding place away from the, eyes, the prying eyes of those who were persecuting Jesus. Women were specifically mentioned as they played a significant role in Jesus' ministry, including Mary, his mother. So the early church recognized the role of women, which was countercultural for women freely mixing with men in the Greco-Roman Jewish society. It was more like a no-no in other societies, but Christians gathered 120 of them, including the women who were there. And they all received that touch of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit descended and split himself tongues as of fire, which is the next chapter we'll be dealing with. Mary is specifically mentioned for her role as Jesus' mother, who did not only give birth to her son, but also assisted in the birth of the early church. As they all devoted to prayer in one accord, the undue veneration of Mary by some should not hinder our appreciation of her important role in the history of salvation. Mary is still important. She doesn't save anyone. She is not to be prayed to or anything. But she is important. We don't have to think, you know, she did not con- She contributed immensely. She suffered the agony of seeing her own son being crucified. The 120 disciples, composed of men and women, waited first for baptism in the Holy Spirit. And we don't talk about this that much these days. They waited before doing work. They waited for baptism in the Holy Spirit. Because that was the instruction. Wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then go and be my witnesses.
but they all join together constantly in prayer. In verse 14, they all join together constantly in prayer. The Greek word translated together is homo thamadon, literary meaning with one mind, one passion. It suggests unanimity in community. And that is characteristic of the book of Acts. They were all one, in one mind. They first waited for baptism in the Holy Spirit. They didn't first wait for the return of Jesus Christ. They waited for baptism in the Holy Spirit. I don't know why we are so eager, waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wait for baptism in the Holy Spirit. Therefore, seek baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's a gift that empowers us to minister. And reference to prayer in a, uh, is abandoned in Luke X, mentioning it 31 times in Acts alone, and it appears 20 in 20 of its 28 chapters. The word constantly is often connected with prayer because, you see, we can't just pray as we dip in and go, go and forget. It's prayer continuously. It means we pray until the answer comes. It means a resolute, something obstinate, persistent. The idea of prevailing prayer comes from this word. Praying without giving up until the answer comes. Pray without ceasing. One writer, Arthur Matthews, said, the spiritual history of a mission or a church is written in its prayer life. Pray until something happens. Push! Let's keep praying for revival. Let's keep pushing until there is revival. That's why we've gone another step, all night prayer. Strange in these days, but it's necessary. Prayer makes us ready to receive. Jesus emphasized that we ought to pray and not give up. He illustrated this with the parable of the persistent widow. He also prayed an all night of prayer before choosing the 12 disciples, even though one of them betrayed him. So if Jesus needed an all night of prayer before making a decision, why do we think it has to be like instant coffee, which is tasteless anyway? <laughs> prayer is a way to engage in spiritual warfare against Satan and his forces, bent on stalling the gospel. That's why in Ephesians 6, 1 to 18, you, you see a war language there, including at the end in verse 18, pray in the Holy Ghost. Revival historian Edwin O. observes, no great spiritual awakening has begun anywhere in the world apart from united prayer. Christians persistently praying for revival. So you come for the all night prayer meeting, let's pray for revival. The final section, Acts 1, 15 to 26, and will be done. Choosing Judah's successor. It's prayerful leadership appointment. Prayerful leadership appointment is what we see in that section. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of uh, uh, persons was in, in all about 120 and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke uh, beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted uh, his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong. He burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out and it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language Akel Dama that is field of blood for it is written in the book of Psalms may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office so one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus Christ went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of those men must become uh, with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justus and Matthias, and they prayed and said, You Lord who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship 
from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the Lord fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Of course, even though the Bible doesn't then tell us much about Matthias, it's history tells us and tradition tells us that he became a missionary to Ethiopia. First here, Peter stood up and addressed the 120 people in the upper room saying, Brothers, this is the first use in Acts and maybe the earliest Christian designation for church members. The Greek term Adelphos embraces one siblings, both male and female, as was the case among the 120. So brethren or brothers was not necessarily male. It was children of God, Adelphos. My brothers and sisters, my siblings. That's what it meant. But you see, vulnerable men who were insecure began to oppress women, you see. And you ended up with this whole war about women in ministry and things like that. But the early church didn't have that problem. We invented it along the way. Because we want to be superior to someone. Peter considers Judas... Uh, Judas' action is a fulfillment of scripture, though it does not negate the pain of what happened. He acknowledges the divine inspiration of scripture by the Holy Spirit uh, in David. So if you were to read Psalm uh, 69 and Psalm 109, verse 8, also repeated in Luke 22, 22, um, as detailed in verse 16, here you find that Peter acknowledged the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as the Psalms were being written. Judah's sin of treachery was wickedness, which made him irredeemable, hence death by suicide. The necessity of appointing his replacement was twofold. One, it was obedience to the scriptures in Psalm 109 verse 8. And secondly, to maintain the same number of 12 apostles Jesus worked with, each representing one of the 12 tribes of Israel in governance. Is there, Matthew 19, 28. So fulfillment of scripture requires both our discernment and obedient action by faith. Sometimes we just sit and gaze and think, oh, scriptures will just be fulfilled. No, no, no. Sometimes God wants to use a man, wants to use a woman, wants to use somebody he created in his image. As many as have received him, gave he them power to become children of God. That's John 1, 12. He wants to use you and me. To fulfill scripture. But we have to hear from God. We can't make it up. Revival is a sovereign intervention of God. We can't make it up. Witnessing the resurrection was a qualifying criteria uh, for his replacement. As their role to be Jesus' witnesses needed first-hand knowledge of the Messiah's life before the cross and after the resurrection. Events never to be repeated. Yet very unique to the apostles. Two people qualified, equally qualified, presented their names, presented by the congregation of 120 people. So direct divine guidance was now required because there were now two people. So they prayed for God to help them who knew people's hearts. Then they cast lots because on important decisions, traditionally in Judaism, that's what they used to do. By faith they believed God chose Matthias. That's in verse 24. Maybe we would pray, then cast votes. You see, our modern lots are votes. We cast votes by secret ballot. I'm finishing now. Summary key, key lessons from this, and I'm done. Just these two pages. I'll be quick. Seek empowerment of the Holy Spirit by waiting for empowerment of the Holy Spirit, as both promised by the Father and later instructed by the Lord Jesus Christ before his ascension. Have a burden for prayer, for the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and have a burden for revival. There's two absolute truths, priorities, two absolute priorities. Burden for baptism in the Holy Spirit, a second infilling, a third, a fourth, a fresh anointing. And pray for revival. Once empowered, go about doing the work he assigned. We were assigned some work. 
which is evangelism. Witnessing for him till he comes is what we were assigned. Not the other things we prioritize. So let's wait for his return whilst practically obeying his instructions. The instructions are so simple. The Holy Spirit was to was not given for just speaking in tongues and prophecies, but for witnessing. We have misplaced the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Main purpose was given. Witnessing for him till he comes. I'm speaking to me too. Not just to somebody there. No, me included. The pain of defection is real, especially by those who, who defect, who, who are part of us in the ministry and so on, and all of a sudden they, de- they desert us. All these Christians experienced it. Because if you hear Peter narrating it, he's saying he was one of us, he was part of this ministry. In fact, he was an apostle, but you know, he, he, he defected and he even bought a, a, a field and he ended up uh, uh, falling uh, head, head, headlong there with his tummy, the, uh, all, all the intestines out. What a shame to the gospel. What a shame to Jesus Christ. What a shame to the movement. What a shame to the church. He was part of us, but see what he did. It was so painful and embarrassing. So sometimes we'll be embarrassed by people who defect, but we've got to release them. We need to manage well any personal hurt from colleagues who betray us. The defection of some will even embarrass us to be an embarrassment to us. How did you... You are a man of God. How didn't you see this? Why didn't you see this coming? Huh? It can be embarrassing, but release them. Just follow what the scriptures say. Choosing leaders prayerfully here Together, as a community of believers, it is God who knows the hearts of mankind. It's a congregational participation with direction by a leader. That's what they did. How did they end up with two names? It's because people suggested those two names, right? Among the 120, they suggested two names. Who shall replace this Judas? Some said Matthias, others said um, the other name, uh, Judas Justice, you know? They say Justice, um, also Basabas. And you now have two names. So what do you do? You have to cast lots. So as a practical discipline, always present two names. Then pray for God's choice before you cast votes or show by raising of hands. You know, after theological reflection disqualify any campaigners. We are equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. This is deliberate. Leaders are to guide the reflection on the scriptures. Casting lots on two equally qualified and experienced candidates following corporate prayer ensured impartiality of choice. Lots were used on important decisions in the Old Testament pre-Pentecost. Now, we are guided by the Holy Spirit. We don't use the laws anymore. So when stranded, we end up voting, you see. Because if we have two names, and we choose only one, someone will complain of favoritism, you see. So we've got to do something. We've got to use a method that is acceptable, universally acceptable in the era we live in. Proverbs 16.33, they didn't do it outside scriptural guidance. The Lord is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. That's what they believed. And it's biblical. So they didn't do anything wrong there. But remember, they were still in Judaism, slowly transitioning. Now, we have a task. Remember one of... uh, On the launch, we talked about development, deployment, discovery. Remember all ministry leaders, all home groups, I'm still coming to persuade you to have a 2IC. But let's apply this. 
Let's choose two people. And let's deliberately pray, Lord, of these two, which one have you chosen to take this? Because we are equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, right? Let's practice it. Let's see what happens. I'm sure it is very fulfilling to just know that we have be- the Lord has chosen this one. At least we have allowed him to make a decision. We've done our part. I didn't say go and dismiss all those who are already in positions. No, 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 that's not what I said. Understand me. I'm saying we can now choose the next one. Let's find two names. Begin to pray for those two names, even for three weeks. Then in prayer, come and do by show of hands or by secret, but it's up to you. At least you have done something in the Holy Spirit. Trusting in the Lord. May God bless you, especially for your patience, because this was long. But otherwise, we won't finish this series if we keep cutting it short. Next week, we are on chapter 2. Let us rise. Praise be to God. I hope it made sense to somebody. These notes will be made available to you after the second one. Then we compile them. They will be on the desk there. Whoever wants a copy will get it. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you, Almighty God, for the example of Scripture in the book of Acts. As your children, Lord, we had no theology other than the Old Testament Scriptures the Psalms and the Proverbs and the Prophets. Lord, they applied Scripture to their situation day by day as guided by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we are privileged to have so many resources, so many theological books, so much on the internet, so many prophecies, oh God, to help us be disciplined to rely on the Holy Spirit. Even when we make use of all these tools, help us subject them to the authority of the Holy Spirit so that we can be guided by you, the director of missions. Lord Jesus, this is your church and we are privileged to be leading as stewards, oh God, and it's required of stewards that one be found faithful. We thank you for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We pray, Almighty God, put a burden in us, a burden to seek baptism in the Holy Spirit, a burden to seek your guidance, a burden to fellowship with you, a hunger for your word, O God, because the word of God is the sword of the Spirit. Develop this hunger in us, Almighty God, so that we value one another as a community of believers, a holy priesthood, a peculiar nation. We are a people of God to declare your praises, Almighty Father, so that the whole world may know we are your disciples. Make us one. Help us, Lord, practice the Christianity we so much talk about. We'll be rewarded not for the knowledge of the book of Acts, but for the practice of the practices of godliness and righteousness, as you have said, Lord. Now bless your children. Bless each one of them, Almighty God. You know where each one is. How much I pray, Almighty Father, that Lord God Almighty, those who seek you, be found of them, Lord a fresh anointing, a fresh outpouring of of the Holy Spirit as they seek, Lord. As they persist, Almighty God, intervene, Almighty God, and give them that which has been promised, the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, as we dismiss today, I pray in Jesus Christ's name that let your love, O Holy Father, go with us. Let the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be upon each and every one of us as we live, O God. 
and help us fellowship with the Holy Spirit, our teacher, our paraclete, the one who steadifies our walk day by day, the revealer of secrets, our teacher, oh my God, of the scriptures as we read them. Let this book of Acts, oh God, come alive in our hearts, in Jesus' name. And the congregation says, Amen. Amen. May God bless you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for a wonderful service. Thank you to Swadesh for that, um, that um, uh, assurance of the love of God. We thank you very much. Thank you, praise and worship team, for making this a glorious day. God bless you, everybody. Have tea and coffee in the foyer there.